get right into it. I'm going to show you some of the of the work that I've done over um, the last maybe now it's 10 years looking at the uh, surface reactivity of nanoscale and biogenic manganese oxide minerals. Manganese is an environmentally critical element um, and has a fascinating chemistry. It occurs in three different oxidation states in the environment, manganese 2+, plus, 3+, plus, and 4+, plus, with um, manganese 3 uh, being uh, unstable unless complex by um, strong ligands and um, otherwise uh, forming solids uh, together with manganese 4. Uh, manganese is the third most abundant transition metal. It forms more than 30 different oxide hydroxide uh, minerals. Um, in addition to being um, geologically important, it uh, plays an important role in a number of bio biological processes, including the composition of organic matter, which we've heard a lot about this morning, scavenging of reactive oxygen species, and in photosynthesis. Um, Manganese oxides are present in diverse ecosystems, um, including um, in, in biofilms surrounding plant roots and soils, um, and there are manganese nodules. And I'll show you um, some images. Here you see manganese um, oxides in, in a nodule. Um, in travertine deposits, um, manganese oxides have been identified um, on Mars. Here's a nice slide contributed uh, by Scott uh, showing the importance of uh, manganese oxides in, in regulating the uh, speciation and fate of, a, of a, um, a range of important environmentally relevant trace metals and contaminants. Here's uh, my colleague Margaret Ann Hinkle uh, working at a coal mine drainage site in Pennsylvania where manganese oxides form uh, through microbial activity and contribute uh, to the remediation of coal mine drainage. Um, and so these uh, manganese oxide minerals are present in a broad range of environments. Um, their, uh, their formation is driven through microbial activity. Uh, the homogeneous oxidation of aqueous manganese is extremely slow um, in microbial um, activity through um, a number of different enzyme systems accelerates the formation of these minerals by up to the rate of formation by up to uh, five orders of magnitude. Um, this SEM image shows you Pseudomonas putida GB1, which is a system that I've been working on for, uh, for a number of years. It's a biofilm uh, forming uh, bacteria. And when we look at a cross section, uh, you can appreciate that the manganese oxides are deposited uh, extracellularly in a, in a biofilm matrix. Um, here you see uh, the precipitation uh, an oxidation and precipitation of, of the minerals, uh, which takes uh, place over time scale of hours. The product of manganese ox um, ox oxidation are layer type manganese oxides. They have about one nanometer inner layer spacing, um, and there is stacking disorder between um, the sheets. They uh, harbor a large uh, proportion of point defects, so up to 20%. Uh, manganese uh, vacancy sites in the sheet. And um, the consequence of those vacancies is the uh, presence of uh, layer and interlayer um, cations of lower valence uh, for charge compensation. Um, these interlayer cations can be manganese uh, two uh, or other, other metals. And that's what I'll be talking about in the talk. Um, and this TEM, uh, set of TEM, in uh, images, you can start to appreciate um, these defects, uh, the vacancy sites, and you, you see that there is um, a high amount of structural disorder at the atomic scale. Uh, and so just to kind of summarize, disorder breeds reactivity. These wafer cookies are a nice kind of uh, conceptual model for, uh, for the structure of these minerals. You have a hydrated interlayer um, that accommodates water and um, and metal cations, and you have a large uh, number of defects. And uh, my interest has been in trying to understand um, how a range of, of metals um, bind uh, to these minerals. The approach that we, ha that we have used is to combine um, adsorption experiments 
um, the characterization of, of the oxides using X-ray absorption spectroscopy, uh, PDF analysis, and electron microscopy, um, and then conducting um, X-ray uh, excess at the K-edge for a number of metals and combining that with EFT calculations to help with the interpretation of the excess. And so I'm going to show a couple of studies where we have integrated these so the first question um, that we want to get at is, we know that these nanoparticles are enmeshed in a biofilm matrix. And so how do metals partition between um, organic and inorganic surface sites? And we approach this by monitoring changes in speciation at increasing surface loadings, um, comparing sorption and biomass and biomass mineral, mineral assemblages. And again, uh, using DFT geometry optimization to inform the analysis of the X. In this graph here, you can see um, some absorption uh, edges. And on the uh, y-axis, you have the fraction of uh, nickel sorbs as a function of pH. The yellow dots show you uh, nickel sorption by the biomass, and the green squares show you nickel sorption um, by the biogenic manganese oxides. And while the burnicite uh, component, the manganese oxide component, uh, comprises only 12% of the sorbent on a mass basis, it enhances um, sorption by up to a factor of four more relative to the biomass alone. Um, when we um, uh, plot our data here, what I'm showing you is a cation exchange model. Um, our batch experiments show that nickel sorption um, is uh, accompanied by the release of aqueous manganese 2 plus into solution um, in a regime below about a surface loading of uh, 0.1 mole nickel per mole manganese. Uh, above that surface loading, we see that there is no longer um, manganese release. And so we see the shift in um, uh, higher uh, selectivity uh, for binding to the manganese oxide surface relative to the biomass. Uh, we then can investigate using XF spectroscopy uh, the, bind the binding environments of nickel um, in, uh, in the oxide. And so here I'm showing you XF spectra collected from samples where the manganese, uh, excuse me, the nickel loading increases uh, from 2% to 23% uh, um, per, per mole of manganese. And we see characteristic uh, peaks here for the nickel oxygen and nickel manganese shell. Um, this nickel manganese shell at 3.48 angstroms is characteristic of nickel bound um, as a triple corner sharing complex at vacancy sites. Um, and you see that cartoon here. Um, as we increase the, the nickel loading, we find that this triple corner sharing complex dominates at a pH 6 when we get above this loading of um, 23%, uh, we see two things. We see that we have some, um, we have a second bonding environment, which I'll talk about more in a moment, uh, consistent with the substitution of, of nickel um, into the sheet and that we have a high occupancy of the vacancy sites. Now, um, this uh, substitution of nickel into uh, the sheets here, See the cartoon of the incorporation of nickel um, is really apparent at higher pH values. And here is a spectrum of the 6% nickel loading at pH 8. And again, we have um, the characteristic triple corner sharing the nickel manganese shell, and we have another manganese shell at 2.86 angstrom. Um, so at this higher pH value, we see that uh, about 30% of the total nickel appears as uh, incorporated nickel, and um, that uh, accounts for about 10% of the vacancy sites. And so the, the sorption mechanism of, of nickel uh, by biogenic manganese oxides depends both on pH and surface coverage. And our interpretation of these XF spectra was really facilitated by um, uh, some density functional theory uh, calculations that allowed us to uh, geometry optimize these different end member geometries, the triple corner sharing complex and the nickel um, incorporation uh, species. And with those geometry optimized 
structures, we are able to compare the interatomic distances from XFAS with those derived from DFT, and we found really good agreement between them. Uh, we're also able to lower the sorbed, the interlayer um, nickel triple corner complex, and then lower it progressively into the vacancy site so that we could look at the transition from nickel TCS to nickel substitution and get some insight into whether the TCS species is a precursor for nickel substitution and whether in fact the decrease in proton activity, which we can simulate by removing uh, protons from the simulation favors nickel substitution. And so we um, calculate the energy barrier for that transition um, for these two different pH environments. And we see that nickel substitution is more energetically favorable and that at higher pH values, we have a lower um, energy barrier. So that's a really nice complement to the um, XFAS vacancy. Now, um, I mentioned earlier and showed you images showing that these are nanoparticles. So they're, they're vanishingly small particles. And um, we then, you know, we, we could get a good understanding of the absorption of nickel at vacancy sites or its incorporation. Um, but the work with the biogenic oxides didn't provide insight into the reactivity of uh, different surface sites, those that are um, on the AB plane in the, in the layer versus those that are at the particle edges. And so again, our approach here is to monitor changes in speciation in surface speciation at increasing loading um, and to saturate the vacancy sites with one metal um, as a way of probing the reactivity of the particle edges. And so uh, for this work, we need to remove some of the complexity. So we shift from working on a biogenic uh, oxide to an abiotic one. And here you see an electron micrograph of delta MnO2, which is a, um, a, a good analog for, for the biogenic manganese oxide. Um, really uh, small nanoparticles. And we can see here that the fraction of manganese atoms at the particle edges is increasing um, as our particle size um, increases. And so what we did was we took this delta MnO2 and we prepared two different versions, one where the uh, manganese uh, was present exclusively in the manganese four uh, oxidation state. And so we have the presence of vacancy sites that are unoccupied. And the second material where we, um, we pre partially pre-reduce some of the manganese to manganese three. And so we obtain about 34% manganese three without changing um, the sheet symmetry and overall structure of the oxide. Um, and in this case, we end up with a large fraction of the manganese three at the particle edges um, and some, and also all of the vacancy sites or most of them now uh, covered by manganese three. And so that gives us a system that allows us to probe the particle edges. So let's look at the adsorption again of nickel on those two different oxide preparations. So in the triangles here, we have nickel sorption by delta MnO2 uh, that contains no manganese three, and we see a very high affinity and we reach loadings of about um, 16%. If instead we look at the adsorption of nickel onto the manganese three material, uh, we see lower, um, lower affinity and lower um, capacity. Okay, and so we collect XFAS spectra of samples um, at a range of of loading. And I picked a couple of examples to show you here. So uh, this top one is nickel um, at a 5% loading, so where we still have not exceeded the vacancy content. And we see that our dominant bo bonding environment is nickel in this uh, triple corner sharing complex, which uh, forms at the vacancy site. In the manganese three rich oxide, uh, we have a really different uh, spectrum. And here in the Fourier transform, you see that we have uh, two uh, peaks that emerge as important. One of them is a corner sharing um, species and has a similar distance to the one at the vacancy sites. And a second is an edge sharing species. 
And so we see that the that nickel has different bonding environments uh, when absorbed uh, onto these two different uh, preparations of uh, blood platinum and two. Um, we then wanted to understand if this decreased peak amplitude shows fewer um, neighbors, uh, but then we also found different distance uh, for, especially for um, the edge sharing species, which has a, a peak here between 3.01 and 3.05 angstroms. And we wanted to understand if this would be evidence uh, for nickel binding at uh, the particle at the particle edges. And so again, we, we kind of went to DFT because there's some ambiguity in the interpretation of the excess. And so we had um, these small clusters containing seven uh, manganese of the hedra, and then we're able to, um, to geometry optimize nickel surface complexes in a range of different geometries um, and different protonations. And what we uh, found through this is that for uh, nickel corner sharing complexes at the particle edges have similar interatomic distances. Jacqueline, and, this is your uh, two minute timer. Thank you. Um, have similar distances to those at the vacancy sites, but um, when uh, nickel is bound to the particle edges uh, near a manganese three, um, octahedra instead of a manganese 4 octahedra, uh, we, we predict this 3.05 angstrom interatomic distance. And so the longer atomic interatomic distance that we picked out with the exabs was in fact supported by our DFT um, calculations. And so here uh, to summarize all of that, um, when we don't have manganese 3 in the structure, nickel is uh, forming primarily uh, surface complexes at the vacancy sites, when we have a manganese three rich material, um, we have partitioning of nickel to the particle edges um, in a range of different geometries, corner sharing geometries and edge sharing geometries. Now we've gone back and looked at the adsorption of metals like uh, lead and zinc on biogenic manganese oxides. And these are some, um, some nice EDX maps showing the association of, uh, of those metals with, with manganese, carbon, and phosphorus. And again, when we, when we look at the adsorption of, of these metals, so I'm plotting that on the x-axis, uh, we see some release of manganese into solution. Uh, for zinc we see, and, and lead, we see no release of manganese up until a surface loading of about 10%. And then for lead, as we continue to increase the loading, we see a continued increase in manganese release. Um, this displacement of manganese, we hypothesize to, um, to, to arise from the disproportionation of manganese three in the layer um, upon the absorption of lead. And so, that I, I wanted to show this last study um, to take us to uh, some ideas for future work. Um, so first, a, a, a short summary. Um, the reactivity of, of these manganese oxide uh, nanoparticles depends on, on particle size, so the abundance of, of uh, reactive size at the particle edges, the number of defects, uh, impurities such as the amount of manganese 3, and presence of an organic matrix. Um, while sorption is largely attributed uh, to vacancy sites, the edges can play an important role in scavenging metals when we have vanishingly small particles and when the vacancies are uh, passivated by metals like manganese 3. Um, as I showed you in the, in the last example, manganese 3 can displace lead from, uh, excuse me, lead can displace manganese 3 from the oxides. The surface complexes that form at the vacancies are well defined. We can predict those structural parameters using um, DFT. The complexes at the edges are really hard to identify by XF alone because you have similar interatomic distances. Um, and so the insights from DFT are, are really um, helpful in allowing us to model and interpret uh, the spectrum. And so just to finish, I think some, some sort of dreams for where we could use DFT next um, in these kinds of studies. Um, if the sorption of a metal like lead can cause the release of manganese 2 into solution and 
our hypothesis is that that happens through the disproportionation of manganese three. And so it would be wonderful to be able to confirm this reaction me mechanism using computational approaches. Can we model this disproportionation reaction um, together with an adsorption reaction? Um, the particles uh, form and have an interlayer uh, region that's hydrated, and that leads to kinetically limited sorption at the particle edges. I didn't show that data today, but it would be uh, really powerful, I think, to model um, the, the time scales over which uh, metals like cobalt or others uh, diffuse into the interlayer region. Um, and finally, the biomass components that are present in biogenic manganese oxides um, can passivate the particle edges in those systems. Um, and so what is the nature and strength of those interactions? So I'd like to thank a number of uh, postdocs and students that were involved with some of this work. Um, and then some of the, my co-authors on the earlier papers uh, that I presented, um, and especially Kida Kwan, who was the person um, driving the DFT uh, computations, and without whom uh, a lot of this work would